Hello and welcome to our audiences to our National Roads of Departure Program webinar, the Fleet Operator Recognition Scheme known as FORS. This webinar is brought to you today by the NRCP in partnership with the Australian Road Research Board and Transport for London. So just a bit of a background around the NRCP. It's been established to provide a collaborative network for Australian businesses and organisations to help them create a positive road safety culture, both internally and externally. It aims to help organisations of all sizes across all sectors to share and build road safety initiatives specific to their own workplace and beyond. It is delivered by ARB and funded primarily by Government Coalition and ARB. So for more information and more tools, just like this webinar and others, please refer to our brand new NRSVP website. So my name is Jerome Carslake and I'll be your moderator for this session today. I proudly manage the NRSVP and its many activities. So next slide please, Peter. Today's webinar will go for approximately 45 minutes with 15 minutes for questions uh, throughout. So we'll be recording today's session and we'll share it at the conclusion of this webinar. Now, we certainly love to hear from our audience during the webinar. So please ask any questions or share any experiences you have that relate to the content. You do this by typing your questions into the question box in your side panel at any stage during the presentation. So now, uh, our key presenter today is Peter Bingham from Transport of London. Welcome, Peter. Morning, Jerome. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure, mate. So Peter is Freight and Fleet Program Manager for Transport for London and is responsible for freight safety, environmental compliance and construction related projects. He has experience in delivering a wide range of successful transport policies, programs and projects including the Fleet Operators Recognition Scheme, the Construction, Logistics and Community Safety Project and the Olympic Freight Advice Program. So welcome Peter, we're very lucky to have you today presenting to us and dialing in all the way from the UK. So let's get started. Uh, thank you very much, Jerome. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for that nice introduction. Um, as Jerome said, my name is Peter Binham. Um, I work on behalf of Transport for London um, and I project manage the Fleet Operator Recognition Scheme as well as other projects. Today I'm going to be uh, giving you a brief in introduction about uh, Transport for London itself um, and who I am. Um, I'll be giving, a, giving an overview of what is FORS um, how it is run currently, um, what benefits this, oper this offers operators, and what benefits, importantly, operators op um, offers clients, those organisations that might specify FORS as a contractual requirement to work on their contracts. We'll be going over some lessons learned, where we may have gone wrong in the past and where we've addressed those, and where we're going in the future. And finally, uh, just to summarise all those points and where we would like to see FORS grow internationally and see Australia as a potential market. So, briefly, some introductions. Um, as stated, my name is Peter Binham. I'm a Freight and Fleet Program Manager at Transport for London. I'm responsible for the safety and environmental programs within the Freight and Fleet team. Those include projects such as FORS, CLOCKS, and our Environmental Low City Program. Transport for London is the executive body of the Greater London Authority, and it's the, in it's the integrated body responsible for the capital's transport system. Its primary role is to implement the Mayor's Transport Strategy and manage transport services across the capital. It's about an integrated transport system and we're responsible for the whole transport network including main roads, traffic lights, congestion charging and taxi and private hire. So today I'm going to be talking about what Ford is, um, and which is one of our flagship programs. It's been designed to allow people to compete on quality as well as cost and to raise the standards of freight and fleet operations in the UK and beyond. FORS is a unique industry-led accreditation scheme that's aimed at transforming road fleet activity. Transport for London developed the scheme in 2007 with the aim of improving safety, efficiency, environmental protection and raising compliance rates within the industry. It is now a national scheme, although it did start off as purely a London scheme, and FORS is now run by the FORS Community Partnership who have been employed to take FORS to new ge geographical areas and to grow the scheme into other sectors and also commercialise the scheme as it was previously completely funded by Transport for London. The scheme is open to any commercial vehicle operator, anyone operating fleet vehicles such as vans, HUVs and coaches. FORS helps operators to ensure and importantly demonstrate lawfulness and best practice and that's vitally important when tendering for work, as more people are seeking to employ the safest operators in their supply chain. 
Fours has four key work streams or four pillars covering the key main areas of a transport operation. Those are management, vehicles, drivers and operations. Here are some examples of some of the four standards at Fours Bronze. Within management responsibility, we would like to see an individual directly responsible for a transport operation. We need to make sure that that person is competent and that policies and procedures are communicated from the management to the drivers. Fours would like to see a direct link between the management and the drivers to ensure that the ethos of the company is started at the top and all responsibility and risk isn't purely passed to the driver. The next stream is vehicles, ensuring that vehicles are roadworthy, that are meeting their maintenance schemes. That the, that the vehicles are, ins are correctly insured and their fleet performance is managed and monitored. Then the next stream is drivers. Fours mandates that drivers are trained and assessed beyond the legal minimum requirement, that they have health and safety policies for driving at work, including fitness and health, which includes an eyesight check, drugs and alcohol policies, and driver license checking. Finally, there's operations, ensuring that vehicles are routed and scheduled in the correct way, that the transport operation is controlled and managed effectively, and fines and charges are investigated and analysed. These are just some of the examples of the 36 requirements that sit at Fours Bronze. So how do operators get accredited and how do they display and evidence that they meet those requirements highlighted earlier? Well, first of all, they register, and then they're required to undertake a physical audit, an annual audit, to retain the accreditation. The pass rate for this is around about 60% first time, which shows it is achievable, but also challenging, considering the operator knows what questions are going to be asked of them, and there's many resources and tools and training to assist operators to prepare for their audit. If they pass, they, they initially gain bronze accreditation, which is the first part, the first port of call um, within Fords. Once you've got to the bronze accreditation, you have the ability to progress through the schemes to silver and gold. Different organisations specify different requirements. Some state you must be bronze, some say silver or some gold, and others like to see people progressing through the scheme. When we get into four silver, that's where the vehicle equipment, additional vehicle equipment is required on vehicles, and some additional driver training is required at all. This is being built on by the construction industry, who see the issue of vulnerable road users and safety as key to their projects. And then at the pinnacle is gold, these are for operators that have evidenced improvements and shown that they've embedded the four standards throughout their supply chain. Ultimately, FORS is there to improve fleet standards. It allows operators to compete on quality and not just cost. And in an area where rates and margins are so low, this is one way of specifiers and clients ensuring that they only have the safest operators working on their supply chain. How big is FORS to date? Well, FORS is very successful. It now has over 4,500 accredited operators, consisting of around about 135,000 accredited vehicles. We've seen significant growth since 2007, and even with the introduction of fees, FOR still sees growth of around about 25% 25% a year, and also sees growth internationally and throughout the UK. Initially developed for London, FOR previously had lots of operators based within and around the capital. However, since Fords has become a national scheme, we've seen growth in other regional areas, as well as across Europe and beyond. The importance of having the ability to audit over large geographical areas is vitally important, where supply chains are spread across international borders and operators are required to gain accreditation, even though they may not be in the UK or Europe. This is a map that shows where Fords operators are accredited today. In the bottom right-hand corner, you'll see that Qatar is now starting to accredit some of its bus fleet and coach fleets in preparation for the Football World Cup. Qatar wanted to see an international uh, recognised standard and see how a safe their operation was prior to the World Cup. Therefore, they invited Fours auditors over and are now embedding Fours within that supply chain. You will also see that Fours has large operators in many of the industrial powerhouses of Europe, ensuring that the construction supply chains can still deliver compliant vehicles and compliant products to meet contractual requirements. So how is FORS run? Previously, it was, it was solely run by Transport for London and funded by Transport for London. However, in 2014, it was seen that FORS was being embedded in supply chains across, across the UK and went beyond the scope of Transport for London. Therefore, in 2014, Transport for London ran a competitive tender to seek an organisation to grow FORS commercialised fours and also move into other sectors. 
The successful organisation was an organisation called the Fourth Community Partnership, which consists of AECOM, who are responsible for the administration, the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, who are responsible for the governance of the scheme, and Fleet Source, who are responsible for the auditing and certification. Ford is an industry-led scheme and it's vitally important that industry feel ownership of it. Therefore, the Ford's governance group is responsible for ensuring that the governance and standards of Ford is fit for purpose and industry respected. Therefore, within the group, there's a fair representation of enforcement bodies, of large construction projects such as HS2, which will be Europe's second largest um, engineering project, um, and small operators such as Donovan Waste, but also large international fleets such as DHL and TNT. You'll see in there we also have trade associations such as the CPT, the Confederation of Passenger Transport, and the Society of Operators and Engineers. This ensures industry ownership and also industry expertise when rewriting the standards and seeking those benefits that operators want um, as part of their um, fee. There's also a Ford Executive Group. Due to the commercials of Fours, it's vitally important from Transport for London's perspective that fees of Fours and the commercial aspects remain relevant and good value for money. Therefore, two years ago, the Ford Executive Group was established, and all these organisations sit on that, and they're responsible for, for endorsing and approving any commercial changes to the scheme. They review the value proposition and would endorse any changes. This is a good way of ensuring that the concessionaire is, is, is restricted in, in increasing fees in the final years of the contract. That's the first part of the presentation. I was wondering, does anyone have any questions? Uh, we have a couple here, and I certainly do invite others to go ahead and, and throw their questions forward if you could. Um, so first question here is around the auditor's side of things. How do you, how do you ensure the auditors are actually properly accredited and have the skill level to be an effective auditor? I mean, that's a good question. We've got to ensure that the auditors are competent and, and have the skills, knowledge and experience to go into a transport operation and ultimately make a call which affects someone's accreditation and ability to win work. FOR's auditors have to meet job specifications, which include a certificate of professional competence, which is the legal minimum requirement for running a transport operation in the UK and Europe. Additionally, auditors undertake three days training, um, which looks at teaching them the standards, teaches them auditing skills and communication skills. But there is a strict line of um, uh, job, jobs, there's a uh, strict job spec, um, which they must follow. Um, we have around about 70 auditors, um, and there's a, there's a strict policy on their behavior as well. Great, another question here from Stuart. Um, the question he asks is, is there a cost variation between bronze, silver, and gold? Yes, there is. Uh, the Ford bronze audit, which everyone must undertake on an annual basis, um, is around about £450 um, per audit, with a £65 administration fee. Uh, the silver and gold is an electronic evidence submitted um, accreditation, and therefore that fee is reduced. And it's around about £200 mark. There's also, this, uh, unlike a lot of schemes, because Transport for London um, has a direct responsibility to protect SMEs, and that's small and medium enterprises, there's actually a diseconomy to scale. Um, within the pricing structure of force to ensure that smaller operators actually pay less per vehicle than the larger operators. So that's vitally important for, for Transport for London. Um, question here from Blair. Are all auditors UK based or does each country undertake its own audit process? No, um, we have an international network of auditors. Um, 70 auditors cover, covering the whole of Europe. Um, the one in Qatar um, we flew an auditor out primarily because there weren't many of them. Um, however, no, we have a network of auditors covering the whole of, U of Europe. Uh, the concessionaire is tasked with having the ability to audit anywhere. Uh, therefore, where demand is, they will establish a, a network of auditing capabilities, which in could include recruiting individuals or working with organisations in, in that country to ensure that they have the, audit the relevant skilled auditors to undertake the task. Right. Um, just a question from here, I'll just vary this a little bit from Peter. Uh, why would we have a scheme like FOURS in another country if we had existing accreditation schemes? Well, f well because FOURS is uh, industry-led, uh, because FOURS um, has a, is a catch-all for other accreditation schemes, FOURS is uh, continually raising the bar and it's vitally important that an accreditation scheme isn't a snapshot in time. 
many accreditation schemes could be perceived as paying your money and getting your badge, which isn't ultimately a, a true accreditation scheme. What FORS does, because its standards are reviewed every two years, ensures that other standards are moved along with it. A lot of contracts within the UK and Europe now state FORS or equivalent. So there are other accreditation schemes, but those equivalencies are, are, are forced to improve their standards every two years to ensure they align with FORS. Cheers. And I got a question from Joel. Sorry, sorry about that, Peter. No, sorry, carry on. I've got a question here from George. How are you operating in Qatar? Any plans for UAE? Yes, UAE, um, AECOM um, work within the uh, Department of Transport within um, UAE. There is um, ideas to grow within the UAE, um, in Qatar, in Saudi, wherever Ford's um, can grow, um, we would like it to do so, and, and AECOM are tasked with that growth, um, and we will continue to encourage them to do that. If there is demand in areas where there's high construction and, and road safety is taken seriously, FORS is obviously a mechanism that for them to do that. So, just a question for you. Um, so, why has TFL gone on and sort of led the charge in developing FORS? Uh, honestly, because there was because there was nothing there initially, um, because the compliance rates within um, this sector were low, and because we take our work-related road risk seriously, we wanted to ensure that only the safest operators worked in our supply chain. It was vitally important for Transport for London to lead from the front and to practice what we preach, and therefore it was vitally important that we established an accreditation scheme which we think moved uh, legal regulations or moved the requirement on transport operations quicker than what it might have done otherwise. Within the UK, we're reliant on uh, European uh, directives for our transport operations, and sometimes we, they may not move at the speed we require. Therefore, FORS has the ability to respond quickly um, and effectively to modern challenges, such as security. We're now developing e-learning modules and security and terrorism on the back of the recent effects within, Lon within London and beyond. Force just has the ability and is the tool really to make change quickly to address modern day and current issues. Right. Um, and just before we move on, there's a question here from Nathan, which sort of draws on a little bit what you were just talking about then. What do you mean when you say that FORS is a catch for all other accreditation schemes? Does FORS recognise accreditation under certain other schemes as meeting FORS requirements from Nathan? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Exactly that. FORS has the ability to recognise other accreditation schemes as being equivalent to the scheme. There's also the ability for other accreditation schemes which show that they're aligned and adhere to the FORS standards to actually issue the FORS accreditation on the back of their independent order. This allows um, or it tries to encourage a single accreditation scheme or a recognisable badge. And you'll see later on there's a slide which shows that 85% of industry want one accreditation or a single accreditation. There's nothing worse for operators than requiring a badge to get on that site, another accreditation to enter that city. Um, it's much easier if there's that one catch-all um, accreditation of because FORS is ultimately um, owned by a transport authority that doesn't have the same commercial objectives as other organisations. We have the ability to encourage um, that recognition and to work with other industry partners. That's great. Thanks, Peter. I think we'll move on now and uh, go into the next stage of your presentation. Thank you very much. So, why would operators join the FORS and what are the benefits to them for doing so? Well, first of all, FORS operators are able to display or show that they are safer, more efficient, and more compliant than other operators on the road network. By working with our enforcement agencies and using enforcement data, we've been able to evidence that FORS operators are 76% less likely to be involved in insurance offences, 64% less likely to be involved in MSIs, and 50% less likely to be involved in drivers hours offences. FORS operators have also demonstrated a reduction in injury collisions by 41% and reduction in total collisions by 25%. So by, by displaying the FORS badge and being FORS accredited shows to the general public shows to their customers and to their clients that, for, that they are a safer, more efficient operator than their competition. This recognition um, and these, these savings were displayed and as a result, the Prince Michael of Kent International Road Safety Award in 2015 was awarded to Fords. Other benefit and one of the key drivers of um, organization joining Fords is the client requirements. Many large uh, projects um, and organizations which take work-related road risk seriously 
now um, mandate fours as a contractual requirement. They like to use fours as a filter to ensure that only the safest operators work on their supply chain. As many customers now expect fleet operators to provide and demonstrate their commitment to sustainable fleet activities, FOR's accreditation allows them to do this. This is Mike Brown, this is the Commissioner of Transport for London, and this is TfL's position. It's vitally important as a transport authority or a governmental body to lead, lead from the front. We would like only the safest, most efficient operators operating in London. Therefore, Transport for London uses its buying power and is, is bought into force by mandating it within our contracts. Mike Brown and his predecessor, Sir Peter Hendy, both take work-related road risks very seriously. And as the introduction of force into our supply chain, now you must be force accredited to come in. You must be force accredited to operate on behalf of Transport for London. This has also helped drive demand, but it's also a way of Transport for London displaying and working with industry to say, come with us, we're leading the way, um, do sit with us on this journey. How do operators display their force accreditation? Well, their name is uploaded onto a website, which is updated every 24 hours, which displays force accreditation. People on the gate are able to check vehicle accreditation through that route. Alternatively, the force benefit is the ability to display the force badge. This badge, which can be seen or displayed on the rear of the vehicle, the side or the front, or anywhere of their choosing, does show to the general public that this is a force operator and does not ensure that the driver takes safety, a bit, their safety and their driving skills a bit more seriously. It also allows them access to site, but it's also a badge where if, if people see bad driving, they have the ability to complain or to contact force to see if they can rectify the driver's behaviour. The other benefit for managers, managers and transport managers who are the competent person responsible for the transport operation, Ford has developed nine workshops specifically for transport managers to help upskill um, and, and give them the knowledge to, to undertake their role more effectively. Many transport operators undertake their CPC and never, and never continually undertake any further development. These funded training courses allow transport managers to receive best practice information and by achieving and attending all nine of these workshops, as well as getting a company to force bronze, it was the individual force practitioner qualification, which allows them to take those skills with them as they move through employment. There's also many benefits to drivers. There's funded driver training as well, which is funded by FORS. There's VanSmart, which specifically addresses the issues of van use and how to be safe around vulnerable road users for vans. There's a Stang Legal course, which is about re-educating drivers who fall short of the law or, or have some issues which they need to readdress. There's an O license compliance course, which is a legal requirement within Europe to operate the transport operation, as well as a low city course specifically on anti idling and fuel efficient driving. There's a collision investigation course, which, are, which provides operators and drivers with the skills and knowledge of what to do if, and unfortunately, if they're involved within a collision. This involves talking to the media. Um, talking to the driver's family and ensuring that the driver's welfare is taken care of as well. And then finally, there's safe urban driver training, which, which is one of our largest um, schemes that's been running now for five years. Over 50,000 drivers have undertaken this course, and this is a requirement within Ford Silver. This is where um, a driver is required to sit in a classroom for, for half a day, understanding about the change in streetscape and understanding what a vulnerable road user is and why they're driving the way they are. The next part is about creating empathy and we take them out on a bike by taking truck drivers out onto the road and driving them around the urban area and around HUVs makes them understand how vulnerable, vulnerable road users are and it creates that important empathy and understanding of what we're doing and why we're trying to do it. There's also e-learning modules which are available to drivers. It, it, drivers are able to take e-learning modules covering road safety, cycle safety, van safety and fuel efficiency. These are some screenshots here from the cycle safety e-learning module which shows an incident from three different perspectives. Again, this is about trying to show empathy and understanding, but it does show the high quality of training that FORS has and the high quality of training that FORS wants to share with other local authorities and encourage other drivers to uptake in it. By undertaking the training, because it's a contractual requirement and you may be checked at gates, once you undertake the training, your name is automatically uploaded into a Ford Professional Training Register. Operators, the clients and people on the gate are able to check and verify that, organ that the driver has undertaken the required training, um, therefore allowing them onto site or turning them away. This is a screenshot of what I've been doing over the last few years, um, but it is a way of taking the skills and the knowledge with you if you move between companies. 
Fours has also, has also started to improve the general training on the market. Because Fours states that drivers must undertake approved progressive training, the word approved, Fours now has a mechanism to approve training. And if, if individuals or organizations develop training which meet the same knowledge, learning, and outcomes and have the same quality as Fours expects, they can receive the Fours approved training badge, which is the Ford professional logo. By displaying the logo, operators, um, training providers are showing drivers that their name will be uploaded onto the Ford database. It's showing that they're of a certain quality. And it is a way of just raising the general quality of training, which could be seen as a tick box exercise within many organizations. And what are the client benefits? Organizations are specifying for, such as Transport for London. Why do we do it and why do others do it? Well, one of the key things is obviously it's a good way of filtering out organizations. So only the safest, most efficient and compliant operators work on our supply chain. It's a way of us showing that we, we want operators and organizations to follow our lead. But it's also important that it has the ability to communicate and engage with the hard to reach. This is a breakdown of Ford's accredited operators, and it shows that just under 60% of operators have under 10 vehicles, which are traditionally the hard people to communicate with but also represents a large proportion of the organization. The slide on the right, the image on the right shows that 57% of operators aren't a, many, aren't a member of any trade association. Therefore, the general uh, communication methods may not be as effective. What FORS does with its e-news um, and its, and its uh, events has the ability to communicate with its hard-to-reach audience, and that's vitally important to ensure that the hard-to-reach may not be doing the right thing, know what is expected of them, and know how to work and engage with FORS. A vitally important part of FORS is the ability to remove the accreditation as well as, as issuing it. Many accreditation schemes issue a badge, um, but removing that badge is very difficult. FORS has developed strict terms and conditions, a compliance matrix, as, as well as um, a guidance to ensure that operators remain compliant and those that aren't are removed. FORS does and and will do remove the accreditation of operators if they provide false information or audit, fail to maintain the standard or damage the reputation of the scheme. But on the right hand side there is a clear menu, if you want to call it that, a menu of offences and complaints and the outcome of that complaint. This ensures that the standards are maintained. The issue of removing accreditation by or termination or suspension ultimately could affect the company's ability to operate. Therefore, um, they do take this seriously, um, and if FORCE does remove the accreditation, those terms and conditions have been legally checked to ensure that any judicial review or any legal action will be challenged by, by FORCE to ensure that, those, that the FORCE badge is, is removed. This, again, gives specifiers confidence that only the safest operators work on their supply chain. Excellent. Thanks for that. Uh, Peter, I've got a question here from uh, from Mark. So, when an organisation is removed from the scheme, have they returned to it as well? That's that's very important. The fours isn't about kicking operators and so they can't come back into the scheme. There has to be a mechanism to re to bring people back into the scheme. Operators will either be terminated, suspended, or issued with a warning. If they have a warning, then obviously we keep an eye on them, but we may provide them with an action plan, and that action plan will outline actions they must undertake to get back into the scheme. That could involve bringing on additional transport managers, that could involve a to undertaking staying legal courses, or it could involve ensuring that the vehicles are rectified prior to being brought back in. A termination lasts six months as a minimum with the action plan play, put in place. If operators can sit out for six months and then show that they have addressed everything and working with force to improve, force will allow them back in. It isn't a closed shop. It's very important that operators can come back in um, and there is a mechanism to bring them back in once they provided force with the confidence that they won't undertake the same issues again. Uh, question here from Len. Uh, what is CPC training? Don't drivers just need a license? No, within the EU, the EU directive states that drivers must, have, must attain a CPC, which is a Certificate of Professional Competence. So there's two, within Europe, there's two requirements. One for the transport manager, which has been there for a long time, called the Certificate of Professional Competence for Road Transport Operations. But there's also something called a driver CPC, which was introduced in Europe a few years ago. 
This ensures that drivers undertake continual professional development, which is recognised and, and accredited um, through something called JALT. They're required to undertake 35 hours periodic training over a five-year period, so therefore seven hours, um, seven hours a year. This ensures that drivers um, can, uh, are continually improving and, and uh, polishing their skills. The problem with this, and this is where Fours adds the additional benefit, and one of the reasons Fours is so successful, is that ultimately the legislation was so weak that drivers have the ability to could have the ability to undertake the same course five days on the trot, um, just as a tick box exercise. That flexibility means they haven't. It's it, it sometimes not fit for purpose because Fours has a mechanism to say you must undertake approved progressive, covering safety or an environmental aspects. Fours is now introducing um, a structured approach to CPC training, which is really going beyond what the law states at the moment. However, Transport for London and other organisations within Europe have been lobbying for change, and it does look like the European Union will be changing um, that requirement in the not too distant future to ensure that there's some mandated courses in there. Um, a question here from Chris, I think he's just looking for a clarification. Is it TFL who mm -hmm. takes the action of removing an organisation from accreditation, or is it the cor consor sorry, consortium who is contracted to run fours? It's the concessionaire that's responsible for removing the accreditation. Um, they're under the concessionaire contract. That's one of their tasks, um, and it's vitally important. The reason we, the reason Transport for London is so keen on having everything documented is, first of all, for transparency. People need to know the rules of the game they're playing at. There's no point of sitting at a table if you don't know what the rules are. Um, but it also ensures that because there's a because there's a, a commercial relationship with these organisations, we need to ensure that there's no conflict of interest between the commercials and the enforcing of the standards. TfL, as I said, rely on force to remove unsafe operators. And what we don't want is an accreditation scheme where a lot, where a company which is paying the concessionaire money isn't removed from the scheme because they're paying the concessionaire money. We need to ensure that it's documented and followed. Therefore, Transport for London does ensure and, and squeezes the contract on the concessionaire to ensure that those operators are removed. Okay. Uh, question here from Blair. How have different sectors within the transport industry responded? For example, are larger organisations more supportive given their ability to become accredited? Um, industry has been very supportive. Um, we've had um, big, growth, big growth in certain sectors. Construction has been a large area. Um, and because it's a contractual requirement, uh, many of the costs are actually passed on to the client itself. So many of the operators don't necessarily feel the pinch of the investment. Um, the larger operators often have um, an internal auditing system already in place. Um, therefore, they do see the benefit of it, but it's often just recognizing um, what they do already. But for the smaller operators, and because of those diseconomies of scale, it's a good health check for them. It provides them with guidance, and it may only be it may be one of the only schemes which is offering them advice and guidance to improve their efficiency and sustainability. Because of the benefits on offer, the insurance discount for FOS of accredited operators, due to the recognised reduction in risk, FOS operators are now able to offload any costs on that con with the contract and the additional benefit. So no. We see small we see smaller operators benefiting from fours probably more than the larger operators, although they all benefit because it's a contract when it's a contractual requirement. Is there a cost difference at all for for small and large? Yeah, there is. Smaller operators are have a have a reduced fee, um, and and that's per vehicle. So, again, because of TfL requirement to to um, to protect SMEs. Um, is within the contract to state that those fees will be reduced for smaller operators. So technically, the larger operators are subsidising the smaller operators. Uh, question here from Ken. Um, has there been any take-up of fours in Australia? Not yet. Um, I'm hoping um, we've had quite a lot of interest from some large construction projects um, who are interested in going above and beyond the legal minimum requirement. There are organisations that we are speaking to within Australia who would like to be seen to be leading from the front and showing that they take safety seriously and embedding it within their contracts. So FORS is there for others to take. I would like to open a conversation with anyone who would be interested in taking FORS into Australia. Um, the concessionaire is tasked with growing it geographically and, and Australia is, 
is in that pot. So we would like to open conversations to ensure to see that Fours is um, introduced into Australia. And with, as stated before, with, with 85% of industry um, wanting one single accreditation um, that covers international borders as well, I think Fours could be the solution to assist Australia to improve the road safety of commercial vehicles, buses, coaches and vans. And I guess and this is just a question drawing on a bit further from Justin. Um, are you aware of any sort of truck safe accreditation within Australia um, as the two fours and, and truck safe seem to be very closely aligned? Sorry, can you say that one more time? Um, he's wondering whether you're aware of the truck safe accreditation program that exists within Australia as, the, as it seems to be very closely aligned with what fours is. I'm not too familiar with truck safe. Um, however, I've Taken, I'll take a note to, to look into that. If, if the person who raised the question has any contact within Truck Safe and would like to make an introduction, I would um, appreciate that. Um, but as stated, Fours has the ability to work with other accreditation. Um, and if it, if it has to work with Truck Safe, who, who may be having audit, auditing capability already over there, Fours isn't trying to reinvent the wheel, it's just trying to spread best practice across international borders. And I would happily have that conversation. Right. I think one of the most powerful things I really saw in this um, which was on your graph when you had to communicate and engage with hard to reach and, and that lower 60% mm. small and medium businesses. I think that that's quite a rarity to see such a fantastic uptake in that sector. Yeah, we were, we, uh, we're very happy with that. Um, the, the, the average fleet size in the UK is around about three or four vehicles. Um, that could consist of farms or individual building contractors. Um, who may not necessarily always see themselves as the transport operators. And it's those people that don't, under, don't perceive themselves to be a transport operation because they may only have three or four vehicles are the hard to reach because Fours um, has the ability to engage with them um, and listens to them importantly. Um, we see that as a key success of the scheme, having the, the ability of, 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 of attaining the smaller operators who are the hard to reach and, and often may not have the time or the resources um, to try and do the right thing. Fours is helping to guide them and Fours is providing them with funded resources to do the right thing, to be safer, and also to be able to win work and compete and compete um, on quality and not just cost. Excellent. All right, Peter, I'll let you move on. Thank you, Jerome. <clears throat> So Ford also has the ability, the reason Transport for London and the reason other local authorities and transport authorities across the UK and Europe see Ford as, uh, as a good solution, and the reason it goes above and beyond the legal minimum requirements is that it has the ability to address priorities prior to legal change. So for example, Ford was initially established to address the general safety of HGVs in London. However, as the European Union and as air quality becomes more of an issue, Ford and its ability to rewrite standards every two years, is now introducing air quality standards. These include anti-idling, as well as performance management of fuel and carbon and, and PMs. It also has the ability to address the van issue. We've seen a steady decline in the UK of HGVs. As it, there's been an increase in regulation and requirements on HGVs, we've seen a natural slide down to vans. And this is partly due to with the driver licensing and driver shortage as well that's faced in the UK and Europe. Vans are now addressed and, and included within Fours. And as such, what Fours does is its standards are broken down to ensure that they're flexible. So that vans, buses and coaches and motorcycles all follow the very similar standards, but however, some are exempt in certain areas or some are ha have additional requirements there. But because Fours has the ability to move into vans, buses and motorcycles, it has the ability to address issues quickly and effectively. Fours also has the ability to work with large construction companies and organizations to ensure that their individual requirements are addressed. HF2, for example, is um, a, a large high-speed rail link which is being developed in the UK and being built um, over the next 10 to 15, 20 years. Um, their requirements are slightly different to um, TFLs or other projects which happen in the urban area. They have a large non-urban area um, with many vehicles accessing rural areas. Therefore, because of that and because they sit on the governance group, Fours is now recognising that drivers need to undertake training in the specific area and urban envi and, and environment they're working in, not just the urban area. Therefore, their, um, uh, their rural driving training is now being recognised. Security and terrorism. This is a very new development within Fords, but over the last year within Europe, 
there's been many incidents involving um, vehicles being used as weapons. And you'll see within the press being driven over bridges and into, uh, and, and into high built up areas, vans, and ultimately trucks are being used as weapons. Ford is now working with the enforcement agencies and counter-terrorism officers to develop standards and guidance and tools to try and address this issue. An e-learning module will be released later this year, and security and terrorism standards will be embedded within Ford's um, in November 2018 when the standards will be rewritten. It also has um, the ability to embed other priorities within Ford's, and I'm now going to give an overview of how Ford's has helped address specific issue within the construction sector and which has resulted in the development of CLOCK, which is exactly and completely aligned with FOURS. HGV lorries are dangerous, um, as uh, stated within the evening standard, however, a necessity within the urban area. HGVs represent less than 4% of the road miles driven in London, however, they represented 20% of fatalities in 2015 and were therefore a disproportional representation of incidents involving HGVs. What did Force do? What did uh, Transport for London do? Transport for London commissioned research in, to look at why certain vehicles, especially within construction, were involved in a disproportionate high amount of fatalities compared to other sectors. The key findings from this research report in 2000, uh, 2013, in 2012, sorry, uh, was that work-related road safety is not considered as important as on-site health and safety. Construction industry 30 years, 40 years ago had a high fatality rate, with, and as a result, a health and safety culture was introduced, which ensured that anyone accessing site must now undertake risk assessments, must be adequately trained, and must and must there must be signs to display that any incident is reported. That's not the case within road transport. Once that vehicle leaves site, who is responsible for it? Is the construction site taking responsibility for that vehicle, even though it's not on site? It is responsible for that vehicle being and moving around the area. There was also a lack of awareness and the ownership of road risk. And importantly, it showed that blind spots on construction vehicles can be 50% greater than other HGVs. This is primarily due to the high off-road nature of vehicles, which creates a blind spot in and around the vehicle. It also showed, this research showed that construction vehicles, as we, knew, we know, were disproportionately represented when it came to fatalities. And there was a lack of collision data reporting. Within other sectors, if you dropped a, if you dropped a cup of coffee on your foot on a construction site, you may be required to complete a read-off form, which is sent to the health and safety executives, and is recorded and analyzed, so we know exactly what's happening. However, within transport, that was, was missing, and we saw, saw that as a shortfalling of why health and safety wasn't being taken seriously. The key recommendations, so having identified some of these problems, the researchers TRL put forward a series of recommendations to address them. These included the creation of a nationally recognized standard for work-related road safety, something consistent that the industry could collectively commit to and work towards. It recommended that the health and safety executive, which is the government body responsible for regulation and enforcement of workplace health and safety in the UK, should extend their reporting to include work-related on-road collisions. It also suggests that the actual design and manufacturing of construction vehicles should be looked at and improved through the collaboration of vehicle manufacturers. There's been some huge strides here in some low-entry cars to ensure that vehicles are fit for purpose. It also said hand-in-hand -hand with this that recommendation is that there needs to be a better understanding of blind spots uh, to ensure that there's connection with construction vehicles. Why are they so much larger? Why are, they so, why are the blind spots so big and why are they involved in so many issues? And the other key recommendation of the report was to call for stakeholders from across the industry to take ownership and address the issues directly. As a result of this, the Construction Logistics and Community Safety Programme was developed, which wouldn't have been possible without Fords. It's all about creating a common standard. Clocks is the question that many construction sites pose, and Fords is the answer that operators and, and transport companies show and display that they've met this, this standard. Clocks has three key objectives. The first work stream is to, to increase the availability and uptake of new lorries with 100% all-round vision and maximum drive direct vision for drivers. In the UK, we're now putting five, six, and seven mirrors on, on vehicles to cover the blind spot. At what point do we say the vehicle isn't fit for purpose, and do we work with manufacturers to address that? We wanted to ensure that if the vehicle's 
couldn't if you couldn't buy a high vision vehicle straight away that all existing lorries are fitted with the appropriate all-round vision equipment including cameras blind spot minimization equipment and sensors the second work stream was out for work related road safety cultures within construction logistics to be considered as important as that of the health and safety culture and finally, uh, to develop a common standard, a common standard for the construction logistics sector that enables transparency and ownership of work-related road risks for developers, their clients, and construction logistics operators. And this is where FORS came in. Because FORS was already established and was proven to be successful and already had the respect of industry, FORS and clocks aligned to ensure that operators and clients who specify that their drivers and, and that vehicles have additional equipment, that drivers have additional training, can evidence this through for Silver. So as I said, clocks is about setting is about clients taking ownership of their work related road risk. It's about creating a standard and it's about ensuring that vehicles are planned effectively to or from site. And FORS is the independent audit which demonstrates that operators have met this requirement. The two are aligned both schemes are initially established by Transport for London, and because of their alignment and because of their close working relationship, we can ensure that as the four standards progress and the clocks, uh, clocks takes that on board as well. Additionally, clocks has the ability and sits on the force governance group to improve changes to the standards and to benefits as well. So if the construction industry has specific concerns, they have the ability to work with force to improve their standards and to amend the independent audit to verify that those standards have been met. So looking at the lessons learned to FORS, I said FORS has been going since 2007 and we have learned many lessons. It started off as a scheme primarily for London, however it's now become an international commercial scheme um, and we have learned some lessons during that process. The first lesson is to create demand. TFL created demand by inserting in our supply chain. Um, and we also worked with other specifiers and organizations that want to take work-related road risk seriously to provide them with the contractual clauses to insert within their procurement activities to ensure that accreditation or a certain standard of operator was recognized. Transport for London did this firstly uh, to take our own work-related road risk seriously. Second, to show industry and to show other governmental bodies and organizations around the world that we will lead from the front and we're keen to practice what we preach. We cannot ask other operators and organizations to raise their standards if we're not doing it within our own supply chain. The second important point was high level support. To, because it's a contractual requirement and the commercial aspects do become involved, it's important to have the support from the top. We have the full backing from the commissioner, and we're, I'm very confident that in any situation, he will support FORS and make, when it's making a decision on safety-related issues and not commercial-related issues. Having the support from the top is important because it also empowers individuals when they're negotiating contracts with large organisations to say, no, this, is a, this, is, um, this must be undertaken. It also gives individuals who work on the gates confidence to turn away vehicles who are non-compliant and not meeting the standards. Providing this high level of support is vitally important for the success of the scheme and also important for organizations who want to enforce their contract effectively. The third point is enforcing the standards. Having the ability to remove people from the scheme is important. We realize that there's nothing worse than damaging the reputation of the scheme than two operators competing for work, one of them winning it on the back of having FORS accreditation, but the operator across the road can see every day that that operator falls short of the FORS standard. Having the ability to work with operators to improve their standards, but also having the threat to remove operators through terminations, suspensions and warning is important for it to be recognized as a quality accreditation scheme. It's important to have industry buy-in. We are a transport authority, Transport for London, and we realize we may not always be the best organization uh, to provide new guidance and um, new standards. Therefore, by working with industry, we can work with them to harvest best practice, to understand what's going on out there, and ensuring that the standards and the benefits remain fit for purpose for the industry it's trying to represent. Another change we had was FORS until 2012 was known as the Freight Operator Recognition Scheme, as you can see on the right-hand side. The Freight Operator Recognition Scheme was exactly the same. However, the word freight was putting organizations off signing up to FORS. 
Many organisations involved in transport may not necessarily perceive themselves as being within the transport industry. They may only be driving from A to B with a part load or to service some, some machinery. However, they are involved in the freight sector or the fleet sector and therefore we rebranded to encourage the utility sectors and other organisations to get on board. We also, you can see Transport for London used to be on, this, on the logos. You, you will not now see the Transport for London logo on the Ford website or any material as having Transport for London limit the potential growth of the scheme and ownership of the scheme. And therefore, Transport for London have removed itself from the scheme um, and ensure it's got its own independent entity, um, identity. It's also important to have geographical coverage, having the ability to audit across large geographical areas, especially within construction where supply chains may spread across international borders giving operators an excuse not to comply because they're based outside the, the country is not good enough. Therefore, having the ability to audit across the whole of the supply chain is vitally important as it removes the excuses of not doing the right thing and not becoming compliant. And also willingness to pay. Transport for London completely funded FORS for five for six years. Um, and while we were going out to while we were out going out to tender, we weren't sure of what the decline would be in membership when fees were introduced. Operators were showing that there'd be we from market research we anticipated a fifty percent fall off in accredited operators in the first year with fees being introduced. However, in the first year alone, falls grew by thirty percent which I think is testament to the benefits that organisations see within Ford. If they can obviously see value for money, and they can see that the scheme pays for itself and gives them confidence that they are in a safe operation. As stated before, one of the key lessons and one of the things I would encourage other organisations in other geographical areas to understand is that industry wants one standard. Industry don't want different badges and different accreditations to get onto sites. They, what they want is one individual standard, and 85% of industry want that one common standard. Commercial Motor and Transport News Brief both undertook research in 2015 to speak to operators to see what they want. Operators want one standard, they want the single badge, and they want an effective route to gaining accreditation. They don't want multiple standards and multiple badges, they want the one single solution, and Ford is that solution. So just coming to an end now, we'll have some time for some questions in a second, but just to summarise, we Ford has been hugely successful, Transport for London puts our reputation on the effectiveness of Ford and we've embedded it within our own supply chain. Ford is a success, it's commercially successful now, it covers geographical areas and importantly it has the respect um, of industry and private commercial organisations inserting Ford in their contract shows this offers benefits to both operators and clients, whether that's insurance discount, the funded training, the ability to win work, or in the client's perspective, confidence that they're only the safest operators working on their supply chains. It allows people to compete on quality and not cost, and in the UK, transport operations are working on margins of 2 or 3%, and with the fluctuation of fuel prices, this can obviously catch operators out. And as a result, not the safest operator is winning work, but ultimately the cheapest operator, which can sometimes mean not the most safest, most effective and most efficient operator out there. It gives organisations operational confidence, both the operator and the client, gives them confidence in them what they're doing. And it's an independent audit which can give them a health check every 12 months to show what they're doing right and what areas they could improve on and what resources are available to help them to do this. It also evolves to address issues and priorities, and you can see that with the security and terrorism, the air quality, and we're also developing a noise uh, workshop at the moment as well, which is to address some of the issues of construction in urban areas working 24-7. And importantly, it's an international opportunity. FORS is owned by Transport for London. However, as a transport authority, we're keen to share best practice and would like to work with other organisations who would like to feel ownership of FORS and to take it into their countries. We would like to work with these transport authorities to take advantage of the Ford brand of our e-learning and of our training. I'm happy, we're happy to share our training, our e-learning and all our tools and guidance with other organisations to ensure that best practice is spread throughout like-minded organisations. At the bottom of the screen, you will see the website of Ford Online. I do encourage all those on here today to go onto that 
have a look around. And anyone who would like to have logins or would like access that operators receive to Fours Online, please do email myself, Peter Binham. Uh, my email there is at the bottom. Um, and I will see what um, access I will allow, uh, we, we can allow. But I'm really keen to work with other organizations to take advantage of this. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. Excellent. Thank you, Peter. It doesn't really get better than that for sharing, I must admit. So, a few questions straight away. Uh, one here from Len. In New South Wales, a car driver can get a heavy vehicle license with just one day's training and then go on to the job. Rarely is any other training completed. There's no legal incentive to do more. What do you think about this? Um, that is uh, slightly different to the UK approach. Um, without knowing the, the exact specifics of the of the training, but to become a, a competent driver, we would expect drivers to undertake um, slightly more than uh, one day's training to show competence within the UK. Um, you are required to undertake, as I said, that 35 hours periodic training prior to starting work to ensure you have that CPC, as well as undertaking the different license checks. Ultimately, transport drivers and freight drivers and fleet drivers are professional drivers. Um, and as a professional driver, the onus on them should be higher than that of a standard driver. So we would expect organizations that employ professional drivers to expect the highest standards of their drivers. Great answer. Uh, question here from Liz. What was the TFL investment for the initial five to six years? And what is the ongoing annual sort of cost to administer the scheme? Mm. It, it, by the end, because the scheme grew so big, it was costing Transport for London just shy of a million pounds a year. Um, initially, it was a lot less than that, purely because it was a smaller scheme. Um, however, towards the end, it was costing Transport for London around about a million pounds a year. And that wasn't including staff time. We had a team uh, that the business model employed was I was the contract manager and we had organizations who were undertaking individual tasks on our behalf, but we were paying for all the audits. Today, uh, this costs Transport for London nothing um, apart from my time um, and Transport for London makes no money whatsoever from the scheme. The commercial side of the scheme we are quite strict on and we like to, keep, we like to monitor. But we like to ensure that all profit is reinvested back into the scheme to ensure that it remains a value proposition and to ensure that, the mo that our priorities are being addressed through an independent accreditation scheme rather than potentially Transport for London or other local authorities funding these resources. Uh, question here from Matthew. Uh, when you move to the willingness to pay, how has the cost compared and changed over time since you withdrew? The, the will it so um, the fees have remained constant for the last three years. Um, there has been no fee change whatsoever, um, and any fee change would need to go to the executive group for that. Um, the willingness to pay, yeah, we, we anticipated a 50% reduction in operators, but um, I often think, you know, um, everyone have to admit to themselves, if someone came up to you, which you uh, and asked you, would you be willing to pay for something which you've got free at the moment? The, the answers are generally no. However, if you can display the benefits and show that being an operator and shows good value for, for money, we believe that operators will see the benefit in fours um, and, and ultimately have stayed, and that's been the, the result. Uh, question here from George. What are the requirements for IVMS and other types of data, internal safety policies, etc.? cetera? Say, say that again, please. Uh, what are your requirements for IVMS other types of data, internal safety policies, etc. So within the policy side, force has a requirement um, for, to cover many of the policies. Um, we, the, the auditor will need to see evidence of a policy of, of a access and egress from vehicles, for driving within the highway code, a drugs and alcohol policy, an eyesight policy. All the policies within the 36 requirements of force bronze must be evidenced and displayed. Importantly, these must be reviewed on an annual basis, which is a requirement itself, because many policies sit on a shelf um, and, and ultimately um, become redundant because they haven't been reviewed or they need to be, need to be, be looked at. Therefore, what FOR says, it must be reviewed every 12 years. With regard to data, FOR's mandate um, through a requirement that fuel and, fuel and tire wear is recorded at bronze. We need to see that fines and charges are analysed as well, um, as well as collision data, complaints, 
um, and any other interaction with enforcement bodies or the general public. So uh, with regards to data, this is where we start getting into for silver and gold. Within for silver, operators are, mandate, are, are required um, to um, upload uh, key performance indicators covering the, the operation. At gold, and to achieve gold, operators must display that they've made improvements against these KPIs. Um, and if they haven't made an, um, an improvement, they need to provide a reason why not. For example, better vehicle utilization, or it may be a, you may change from a trunking red network to driving on motorway to driving in the urban area. But data is key for force. All right, question here from Ken. Are you interested in, interested in tailoring force to work within our NH National Heavy Vehicle Regulator? and the required safety management systems that we're currently truck industry needs to comply with from a regulatory requirement? Simple answer on that one is yes. Um, you know, for FORS is, we, we're keen for FORS to work with, with other organisations which take safety seriously. We don't have all the answers. Um, we would like to work with other specialist organisations who can assist us to, to evolve the scheme as much as possible. So, yes, we'd be very willing to have that conversation um, as much as possible, yeah. A question here from Laurie. What research backs up your standards? There's been little research on the efficacy of safety management practices. I've found evidence for some characteristics, but was surprised to find so little evidence in the scientific literature throughout my study. Everything um, for new standards to be introduced, evidence must be supported um, and must be provided to introduce that. So the introduction of vehicle warning signage on the rear of the vehicle to warn drivers of the dangers of the blind spot was supported by individual evidence um, to show that the cyclists and vulnerable road users were unaware of that risk. The other, other examples can include uh, there's a mandatory requirement within FORS for driver eyesight checks to be undertaken every six months by a competent person. This involves um, a competent person, the transport manager, taking a driver outside and simply asking them to read a new style number plate at 20.5 metres. This has come from the British uh, Medical Council to say that eye sites can deteriorate within six months. Therefore, while things are being introduced, we like to see the evidence to support that. We do undertake market research prior to the standards being introduced to make sure that, first of all, that, that the standards are palatable to clients and to operators but also that to see if there's any market research out there to support the introduction of these new standards. And our last question, I'm sorry for those who, who have missed, uh, does bronze fours accreditation address driving hours and fatigue management practices above the min minimum legislated requirements from Chris? It ensures that the minimum, it ensures that the legal requirement is communicated, it ensures that the drivers are aware it ensures that the transport manager is competent in undertaking their task. So what it does do is it does ensure that the drivers have been made aware and have signed, have signed to show they under, understand their responsibility. However, the driving time is exactly the same as the legal minimum requirement. Operators must evidence that, that drivers are adhering to this. But with high non-compliance rates in the UK, many operators do struggle to do this. There has been talk in the past of introducing um, new standards into gold, and, and potentially this could happen in November 2018, where the, the minimum or the maximum driving hours is actually reduced within the foot, um, and operators are required to, instead of having, say, uh, uh, three hours continuous drive or an hour and a half continuous driving as a maximum, they must say an hour and 25. What this would allow would obviously would be to say that um, if there is any shortfall, they are still, still legally compliant. And that's what FORS is about. It's about creating space between the law, which is, um, you know, which, which is the legal minimum um, or compliance, to creating a standard, which means if operators fall short of this standard, of the FORS standard, they are still legally compliant. And by creating that buffer ensures that and gives the operators and the client confidence if they do fall short, they may fall short of the four standards slightly, but they are still legally compliant. Excellent. Thank you very much for taking your time, Peter. I know it's the uh, early hours of the morning over there, so once again, thank you for taking the time, sharing fours with us in Australia, and uh, it appears there's a lot of interest in exploring how there can be greater alliance together. So thank you again. No, my pleasure. Thank you very much. And as I said, any questions, please do email me.